By the end of summer, it was apparent that something very strange had happened. Old farmers in the state referred to 1816 as the 1800 and starved to death. In Ireland, the summer of 1816 was much rainier than normal, and the potato crops failed. In other European countries, wheat crops were dismal, leading to bread shortages. What's important to note is that while 1816 wasn't the coldest year on record, the prolonged cold coincided with the growing season. Hello YouTubers, Alaska Prepper here. Ladies and gentlemen, this will happen again. History will repeat itself. However, we have the opportunity now to make sure that we're prepared if this happens, and it will happen again. And being that we're entered into a grand solar minimum where earthquakes, where erratic storms, where volcanic eruptions happen more often, it is more unlikely that it will happen during this grand solar minimum cycle. What am I talking about? A year without a summer. I know that I put out videos telling you this can happen, that can happen, but take a look back at the videos that I put out telling you that this can happen or that can happen. Fill in the blank, right? Is it probable that those things happen? In my opinion, it is very probable that they happen. That's why I put those videos out. This is a very short story, very short summary of the year without a summer, which is an instance that happened to the world, not just to a certain country back in the early 1800s when Mount Tambora, which was a big volcano and still is, erupted. But what I'm looking at here and what I'm going to show you are the similarities of what happened back then and what just happened not too long ago during this year. You just haven't been hearing about it. I actually pulled up the entire story of all of the things that happened and stuff like that, but I just want to give you a quick summary so that you can have an idea of what to expect if this happens. It's already happened, ladies and gentlemen. This Mount Tonga, I believe is the name, and we'll go over here in a second. It's already happened, but it's a leading indicator. It takes time for the effects of the eruption of Mount Tonga to actually take place from the time that it actually happened, all right? So here it says, and this is from NASA, by the way, uh, Global Climate Change, Vital Signs of the Planet, right? And they're accurate when they say global climate change. This is what happens in natural cycles. In 1815, Mount Tambora in Indonesia underwent the most deadly volcanic eruption in recorded history. The super colossal eruption, which measured seven on the volcanic explosivity index. Remember that number. Remember the number seven. Very important. Pumped out enormous amounts of dust and ash, destroyed crops and vegetation, and killed tens of thousands of people uh, and even caused tsunamis. Now, they're talking about the initial blast. This is not the full effect of the blast. This was just the initial blast. They suggested that the eruption had caused a severe summertime cold snap during 1816 that resulted in killer frosts in New England and Europe. Soaring food prices and famine followed the frost to the degree that 1816 was also nicknamed 1800 and frozen to death. So what they're getting at here is, is that the effects of that major eruption spewed a whole bunch of ash and particulates into the atmosphere and it worked itself around. And because of the particulates in the atmosphere, sunlight could not get in. And what happens when you can't get sunlight? You can't grow food. And it also gets colder than what it normally is. Charles Greeley Abbott measured the sunlight reduction caused by Katmai's eruption, while William Jackson Humphreys went back to the records of the Krakatoa and Tambora explosions. He concluded that Tambora was responsible for the subsequent cooling. So they have a correlation between large volcanic eruptions and the cooling of the planet. I believe it's important that we understand this, especially that now we've got our hands involved in trying to cool the planet artificially. So as we're trying to cool the planet artificially, if one of these things happen, one of these volcanoes erupts at the magnitude that it did back then in the early 1800s, then that's going to drop the temperature of the earth even more, affecting what? Affecting calories. Calories from the sun that transfer over to the earth that make food for human beings. And that's why famine occurred. So now we take it to the History Channel 
to show you their perspective. That way I'm not getting this information from just one place, even though that was NASA. I'm not going to go through all of the gruesome things, you know, of what happened. There was famine, there was starvation, there was even some uh, documented instances of cannibalism, things like that. Uh, as, I, as I always say, ladies and gentlemen, when things happen that's out of your control and you're not prepared for those things, humans tend to do things that they never would have even thought of doing before just to stay alive. Is the flight or fight theory, I guess you can say. What caused this calamitous year without a summer? At the time, many people believed that the chaos were from some kind of divine uh, retribution. But most scientists now place the lion's share of the blame on an Indonesian volcano called Tambora. In early 15, in early 1815, excuse me, Tambora roared to life with one of the most devastating volcanic eruptions on record. Now remember that number seven that we were talking about. Here, they're talking about uh, the most devastating eruption on record. Right, and it was a VEI volcanic eruption, I think, or explosive index of seven. Right, Tambora roared to life with one of the most devastating volcanic eruptions on record, an explosion ten times more powerful than Krakatoa. Along with killing thousands of locals, the blast also spewed sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. The ash cloud drifted across the globe in the months that followed, blotting out the sun and creating a volcanic winter. When combined with the lingering effects of the Little Ice Age, because remember, the Little Ice Age happened, I believe, was like uh, between the late 1600s and 1700s, but it still stayed a little bit cool once we got out of that cycle. It, st it still had to start getting warmer. So in the early 1800s, it was still cool from the effects of that Grand Solar Minimum, the Little Ice Age. I believe it was the Maunder Minimum. And I believe that the Grand Solar Minimum that we just entered now is called, I think it's called the Eddy Minimum, but don't don't quote me on that. Let's see. Um, when, when combined with the lingering effects of the Little Ice Age, a period of global cooling that lasted from the 14th to the 19th century. Wow, it lasted that long. The sun-snapping paw was enough to lower the planet's average temperature and send weather patterns into a stale into a tailspin so you see that's what happens during a grand solar minimum is we have erratic weather if something like this happens unfortunately we can have a year without a summer and how prepared are we ladies and gentlemen for this to happen now taking a look here it says tonga's volcano was the largest explosive eruption of the 21st century and scrolling down it says researchers used a newly developed algorithm to identify the scale of the Tonga eruption, significantly cutting down on the amount of field work and direct measurements required. The Volcanic Explosivity Index, VEI, rating for the blast was set at 6, which is one such eruption expected every 50 to 100 years. Now, this VEI is set at 6, ladies and gentlemen. So we got a 6 out of this Tonga eruption that happened not too long ago. I think it was sometime in April or something like that. But this is what I want you to look at. Take a look at the history of these eruptions. Back in 1991, Mount Pinatubo over at uh, in the Philippines erupted. It was a six, right? Now, Mount Pinatubo actually brought down the global temperature, the average global temperature, brought it down by like one degree, by like one degree Fahrenheit. And it may not sound like a lot, but that's an awful lot. And then when you add to it, as I stated previously, that we are now, when I say we, I mean humans, whether they're smart or not, that there are now people that are putting stuff into the atmosphere on purpose in order to block out the sun, right? So we had a six Pinatubo, which was about the same as Krakatoa back in 1883. But look, Tambora was just a seven. So it's not out of the scope. And look at this, Mount St. Helens was just a five. Pinatubo was a six. Tambora was a seven. So that's not very far to go. All we need to do is have a volcanic eruption that measures a seven or higher, ladies and gentlemen. And we have a limited period of time to get as many preps as we can, especially in the form of food. Because this happened before, where people were dying, where people were starving, they had no idea. Now we at least know. Back then, they had no idea what was going on. They didn't know why the sun was being blotted out. They thought it was some kind of supernatural event. Now we have information. Now we have technology. Now we know, hey, if this happens, if I hear that number seven 
or above on a volcanic eruption that happened either in the north or in the southern hemisphere, then I know that I have to take action or at the very least do my own research into that specific eruption. That way I can convince myself. Well, this last one, this uh, Tonga that just erupted, it erupted underwater. So a lot of the stuff that went in the atmosphere was air vapor, which dissipates a lot faster than the sulfur and the particulates that are in the atmosphere. So this one may not cause as drastic a temperature difference than the one that Pinatubo did. And when I say drastic as 1% Fahrenheit or one degree Fahrenheit, I mean that is drastic. One degree Fahrenheit, average temperature reduction. I think it lasted for about a year and a half or two years. And to finish it off, ladies and gentlemen, this is another site from NASA, and it just shows the particulates and everything going around the Earth after Mount Pinatubo. But I wanted to go ahead and finish it off with this so you can have the full spectrum of what it can, it can do, right, if it's higher than a 6. Mount Pinatubo's eruption was about 10 times bigger, 10 to 100 times normal levels. Over the next 15 months, scientists measured a drop in the average global temperature of about 1 degree Fahrenheit. And I say again, What's going to happen if we have a larger eruption and then at the same time we are artificially putting sun blockers in the air? I hope that this convinces you that you need to be prepared for anything. If you've been watching my videos for the last three or four days, every day is like something different from finances, you know, to nature, to man-made, you know, to this. Any of these things, the probabilities of these things happening are very real and they are all cyclic. So that means that they will eventually happen. Maybe not in the exact same way that they happened before because causation does not equal correlation, right? In cycles, causation, meaning that the reason something happened doesn't always have to be to the exact same thing. Let's say, for example, we have an economic collapse, right? Back in 1929, they had a stock market collapse. Why? Because people were greedy. They were very leveraged. And that's what caused the market to finally drop because people realized, hey, there's, this is all fake. So they started cashing in their, their stocks and there were more, more sellers than buyers. Well, we can have an economic collapse today that equals that of 1929 for completely different reasons. It could be because we go to war. It could be because you know, the government is uh, keeping interest rates too high for too long or vice versa. It could be for anything, but we will have another economic collapse or stock market crash that equals that of 1929. It's just, will it, will it, what's the causation for it, right? So the correlation doesn't necessarily mean that the causation will be the same thing. I hope I explained that in a, in a way that you can understand. All right, having said that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining in. I truly do appreciate you stopping by and checking out these videos. And, and uh, remember that today at 2 p.m. Alaska time, 6 p.m. Eastern time, we will have our last live stream of 2022. So hope to see you all there. God bless you all. Have a great day. Now, ladies and gentlemen, for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about nutrient survival. So if you are not in the market for freeze-dried long-term food storage, then thank you very much again for joining in on this video and hope to see you this afternoon during our live stream. Whenever Nutrient Survival has some kind of sale or something new come out, I always take a look at it and I take a look at as many things that I can compare to as possible within the Nutrient Survival site. So I'm taking a look at this five-day reboot kit that they have here. And in addition to, you know, the stuff that you get inside of it, they have a little tracker that you can use for tracking your progress. But what you're looking at here is like five NREs, right? This is like five NREs. So if you take a look at the price of this package here, $139, and then if you use my code AP10, it brings it down $13.90. You're getting five NREs for 120 bucks. In addition to that, you're getting this bottle. This doesn't excite me as much. Yes, pretty cool that you get this bottle. But you're getting five NREs for $120 effectively. Now, don't mind that $50 shipping fee. That $50 shipping fee applies to people that live in Alaska. So unfortunately, I can't just buy one of anything. Well, maybe it's fortunately. So whenever I stock up, I get a whole bunch of whatever I'm getting. So I save up and then I get a good size order and then I stock it up because of that $50 charge and it's something that they can't get away from so I've already ordered about another five of these so I can do this for a month straight and let's see what happens all right ladies and gentlemen but if you take the look at the price of an NRE the price of an NRE is a is a $35 a piece so if you multiply 35 times 5 that's $175 
And even after my discount, you're looking at about $160, $158 or so. So you're getting the same thing in this small box that you would get in 5NREs in addition to the bottle for about 120 bucks. where 5NREs just by themselves, if you order them separately, you're going to pay roughly $158 or so. I think this is a great deal. And I think this is a great way also for you, if you've never tried Nutrient Survival, to take a look at it and try everything that they have or almost everything that they have. Here they have the chocolate, the chocolate shake, which is my wife's favorite. But they also have the shake that's uh, vanilla in there, which is my favorite. They have the triple mac in there, which is well, a lot of almost all of these things are my favorite. But it comes with a, it comes with a breakfast bar. It comes with a coffee. The coffee is the very best that there is. You have to try it. It also comes with like a hydration drink that's full of nutrients and vitamins. It comes with an entree. It comes with a breakfast. I mean, if you want to try out a lot of the things that Nutrient Survival sells at a great price, this is it right here. And you know what I'm gonna do? I almost never do this, but I did do a payday prep with Nutrient Survival. And uh, when it comes in, I told Becky, can you please put it in the front of the line? So sorry, ladies and gentlemen, if your order takes an extra half a day to get to you, because I was like, please put this in the front of the line because I want to start this soon and I want to be able not to run out before my order gets here. So again, if you're in the market for this, this is a great price for an awesome product. You all know I love Nutrient Survival because it's just really the very best and most nutrient dense survival food, i.e., freeze-dried long-term food storage that there is in the market and the people are awesome having said that have a great day god bless every one of you